Welcome everyone to Senate Education, Wednesday, April 26th. A few things on the agenda. We're gonna start with uh, Senator Chittenden who's gonna propose an idea to the committee, uh, an amendment to the budget. We're then going to return to the question of PCB testing in schools with a Dr. Carrie Hornbuckle. Uh, and then we will return to H461, our discussion on uh, bullying harassment then public school admissions, which is really connected to 483, and then 494, an act relating to making appropriations. Uh, this is actually some uh, follows up on Senator Chittenden's language that we're going to hear on now, hear about now. It just generally, I did expect the floor to go much longer uh, than it did, uh, and. But that, since we got off, I appreciate Senator Chittenden joining us. Thank you for this. Senator Chittenden, great to see you. Uh, and do you, not, do you have copies of your amendment? You have them. Oh, we have them in our folder. Thank you. So we are looking, Senator Chittenden is putting forward language. Oh, let me see. Ah. It says, Senators A, B, C, D, E, move that the report on the Committee of Appropriations. Okay, so please tell us what you're thinking. Tell us why you decided to choose to do it in Senate Ed. Tell us, tell us a few things that you know, well, you'd I'd like to see happen. Well, I'll give some background. I also just want to realize that I've been to this committee a few times now, and uh, whenever I get invited to a House committee, I always, for the first time, show up with donuts, and it's always resulted in better results. So, you know, the next time I come down to Senate Education, I'm bringing donuts, okay? I owe you all donuts. Senator Mazza sent us a bag of potato chips <laughs> on your behalf, so. Excellent. Uh, yeah. So I think the reason why I'm here is a couple of, uh, I have a constituent who is also a very knowledgeable uh, person that works in this field and he's also associated with the National Association of Energy Services Companies. Okay. He's contacted me over the years through a variety of different um, hats that I've worn uh, around school construction. So I uh, don't know if any of you know that, recall, but back in 2020, the city of South Burlington, the school district of South Burlington proposed to do a massive reconstruction, a completely new build of the high school and middle school. It was a $217 million project and it was not approved by the voters. Um, the point is in those conversations and the resulting conversations, individuals like this gentleman um, has made very eloquent arguments, or not arguments, but statements that it's important to have people around the table that understand how to retrofit and energy improve existing infrastructures, because there are a lot of things that can be done. So what his organization, well, his company and uh, affiliated or organization focuses on is performance energy improvements to municipal facilities. So he reached out to me last Thursday. We had a phone call. Uh, I uh, believe because I did previously serve on this illustrious committee, uh, and so he, that and he's spoken to me about it before. Did you get that uh, I did. Yeah. He looked at you when he said. And the <laughs> yeah. Okay. Please continue. <laughs> and he had the conversation of uh, he heard about the the working group task force on school construction aid, which, by the way, I fully support all of your efforts. I think that is the right direction to go in. And as uh, the, he was looking at the composition of that, as well as other individuals he knows in other states, he just saw an opportunity to at least um, consider an additional member, somebody at that on that working group, that would also represent um, a, a, an organization that does have some expertise in performance-based contracting. Uh, some arguments so with this proposal that I uh, was inspired to do so from friends in the building um, after hearing from Eric Lafayette. Uh, they caught me uh, the, uh, yesterday morning and just said, hey, this seems to make sense and uh, I don't think, it, I don't know if your committee considered adding that member to this body, but if you look at the 15 member composition, uh, this amendment proposes to add a, uh, an appointment by the governor. Um, but I mean, really, I, I would love for this, I think it makes the most sense if you all support this to bring it forward. Happy to do so if you prefer, but I am not bringing this forward unless the Committee of Jurisdiction supports it. It's a lesson I've learned earlier this session. Trying to be funny there. All right. All right. So, uh, I if, got it. if you all do support this, I would like you to do the legwork. I'd be happy to. Alternatively, um, what this would propose to do, as I got feedback from Senator Kitchell, because it is the budget bill that yep. this would be proposed to amend to, she suggested A, come talk to yep. this committee, uh, and B, she also said, you know, if you add another member, that go up to 16 from 15, it gets a little unwieldy. Uh, in that conversation, she also posited, but again, I'd look to you all as your reaction 
question, what if we just reduce the number of House representatives from two to one and senators from two to one, so we'd have one from each chamber, and then that would bring it down to 13, and then if you added this one, it'd go to 14, and then there's been other conversations as well about other compositions. Who's around the table matters, and I think it would be really important for this group to have a perspective that knows what it takes to retrofit and create energy efficiencies while addressing HVAC system upgrades so that the body doesn't necessarily default to complete rebuilds. Because complete rebuilds, um, as much as they might make sense in certain circumstances, I think there is value to have differing expert perspectives at the table to, to weigh the pros and cons from using an existing infrastructure and modernizing it, making the old new, which I've seen creatively done in a lot of different places. The old McDonald's in downtown Burlington, mm -hmm. the farmhouse group, you been there? It's, you can tell it's the old McDonald's. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. where, which, what's there now? Uh, farmhouse. The farmhouse. Right. It's on Bank Street. So. So that's what this proposal effectively does, is just to um, add a member that represents from, I don't recall what the final language is from, with school energy efficiency and energy performance contracting. There is a nationally recognized organization if you want to be more specific than that, um, but I think this would get you also where you want to be. My question is, does he want to be on this group, or does he want to be on the group that's actually going to be doing the work? Like this tech. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but this task force, I think, is pretty much just going to be working this summer in anticipation of that study coming out. And then, I mean, especially if we follow the Rhode Island model, then, then there will be like this oversight body that will be created that will be working for, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, who knows, and actually doing the work of, the, you know, retrofitting schools and choosing how that's going to happen. And I'm just wondering if if he understands that this group isn't really getting into the weeds in that way. I wouldn't be able to speak for him. Um, and I don't even think I recall him saying he wants to be the one. I think he just he sees a someone, need for yeah. somebody that knows. Uh, and as I looked at the composition and I saw somebody with expertise in building development or construction, I, I just thought, you know, retrofitting energy performance improvements yeah. also might balance that okay. out. But you raise a good point. Yeah, and I also had a request from a student who would like, who thinks we should have a student rep on this group. So I wanted to bring that to you, but that's, sorry, I can do that later, but I wanted to bring that up. But, and also, didn't we originally have one senator and one house rep? And we then, did, and then we, uh, the house asked us to add yeah. another and we added. But we can easily pull it back, which I'm more than comfortable doing personally. I can leave it up to all of you. So it'd be reducing down to, 13 and then bumping up a student and possibly this person or a student and another person Miss Conlon, do you mind weighing in on this a little bit? Are you interested in just you can say there uh, Senator Shindon, but Yeah, so I'm just texting about a, another group and I don't we're not aware there is another group that, um, Okay, it's our impression. This is the group. Oh, no, no no. I mean, it is the group for this now. This is the group that's going to design the state aid program. I'm correct. Yeah, around. yeah, yeah. So that is the group that they were thinking, and as okay. Senator okay. Chen said, they were looking for somebody with expertise in performance-based contracting to have a voice there so people sure. know what those alternatives are. Okay. They're also very knowledgeable in leveraging federal money as well and grant money, so that's oh, another thing awesome. to the table. Yeah, great. No, it sounds good to me. Um, so is there one person in this state? I'm assuming we would ask, uh, we could either ask uh, the governor's office, the speak, we, somebody we'd have to nominate. We don't put names, of course, in these kinds of things. The treasurer is a possibility for the treasurer to appoint somebody. Um, but when this happens, I'm just trying to get a little bit of a sense of, uh, are there, do we know if there are many people out there that do this work? If all of a sudden this person seems great, great, but if not, is this going to slow the process down in any way that, gosh, we just can't find the right person because there only, there's only one in the state and nobody thinks he's there the right one, There's more than one in the state. Okay, there. And that's where I might bring attention back to the National Association of Energy Services Companies uh, and NASCO. They, they might be a better appointing body to have that broader expertise and maybe somebody that uh, um, does, in fact, generally offer. Perspectives on this important topic. 
Senator Weeks, Senator Williams. I would just assume that the governor's office would have, would be open to these types of recommendations on where to source. I, I'd leave the decision up to the governor. In terms of what person? In terms, in terms of which person would satisfy the governor. I'm just thinking about having somebody on there that is involved in the process and then they find out that they, maybe they want to bid on the job. So they would be confident. Well, that's a risk of doing that. Yeah, same day that. Yeah. That could happen with the hygiene, too, the industrial hygienist. And so we'll have to make sure that that gets taken care of. Um, but yeah, my only other worry is that the, the group is get, might get a little unwieldy. But otherwise, it seems like a great idea. And just so we know, so do you want to say anything else about the student? I think it's a good idea. We've it's heard from students. Yeah. Uh, and who would appoint the student in your mind would be good? No, um, you, I guess, is chair. No, you, it, it's either the governor. Uh, no, it's not the chair. The it's AOE. the uh, committee, uh, committees. It could be the okay. secretary. It could be um, Philip. It could be. I haven't really gotten that far. OK. All right, so we're going to meet later and talk about this. But uh, any other questions or, or concerns, if this were to go forward as an amendment from Senator Chittenden, subtract a House member, subtract a senator, and then we bump up and we add um, somebody from uh, you know, this space contractor, space as in this kind of space, not outer space. And then we would also add a student. We could ask Becky Wasserman to draft that. Yeah. Um, can I, yeah, I, yeah, just want to, I want to reiterate for you all that this task force shall seek, cease to exist on July 1st, 2024. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And then there will be an, hopefully another like governing body that will be doing this work for years to come, maybe decades. So he, he, he may also want to be part of that group. The crafting the state aid program, I think it'd be real, it'd be a good value okay. perspective to know what that might entail. Or gotcha. Yeah. Perfect. Happy to bring it forward, uh, um, and I will only do so though if this committee yep. supports nope. it. So, uh, and, uh, am I seeing any objections on what the senator is put, putting forward? We support you without the donuts. Sauce do. donuts. And they uh, they are looking at this tomorrow, so I need to put time pressure. No, there's no. If you would let Ms. Wasserman know that we're reducing the size with House and Senate, we're adding a student, and we're adding your person. You know, and then the question is, uh, who does the appointments? Yes. Yeah, I'd like to come. I, I, I agree with everything that uh, Senator Chendon has proposed, and I, I understand the reshuffling or the redistribution of, uh, of uh, participants. I don't think a student is necessary. Uh, being the being that everybody on the committee had one, at one point been a student, I think they, they can come with that perspective. I, I think it's it's nice to have kind of fluffy, not necessary. That's you say fluffy? fluffy? Yeah, I'm fluffy. Yeah. It's nice to have. It's, I don't think it's necessary. You could give the House two seats and then the Senate one, but I would really no, I don't think we do that. Yeah. I, I mean, I still. To keep it all on. I just, I do, the reason I like the idea of the students, these guys are living it right now more than anybody. But um, it's, it's the committee's decision. What do you think, Senator Kulik? I mean, I like the idea of it too. Um, I also like the idea of having two senators because we were talking about a bipartisan group. Now it would just be Senator Weeks on it. Senator Kulik. See. Let's. Why don't we just? I guess I would suggest just keep it as is. Add the student. Add this person. Um, and there is going to be. This is going to be summer and fall work. People won't be able to show up at, to all the meetings, and we'll just do the best that we can with what we have. Not drop the the rep and the senators. What you just said. I get. I, I. I'm fine with the more the merrier. Does anyone? I mean, I know it's getting big. It's getting big. Yeah. I think if we drop two and add two, I think the chair of probes would also, that means we're spending a little tiny bit less money. Um, She's, I don't know how hardened she is in the position, but she definitely. I think she'd be fine with whatever we end up doing. We're going to talk to Ms. Wasserman at 4.30. We'll talk to her. 
that'll give people a little time to think about whether they want the student. We don't want this to come to the floor. God forbid, and go down. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll Thanks. have you come back at 4.30. With no, no, no songs don't. Leftover cake. Cake. That cake is gone. That cake is, yeah, long gone. Uh, you know, I don't want too much of a debate over this. Week. Don't have much time, but we have Ledge Council coming back at 4 30. So, does it, just, does it have an odd or even number based on no, I don't think it's no, no, I think it's just generally it's an odd number historically, but it doesn't have to be. And nothing needs to happen, we could just forget it. That's the other thing, forget school construction. Oh, no, 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 forget amending the school, the, the committee. The committee's already in the budget. The, right the hardest part you have with this whole thing is. Deciding who's going to be on there. You know, you have one student, right. and it's a male, then they want to have a female on there. And, you know, it's, I think I like the composition the way it is, because it's simple until you start picking people. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I suppose a student can always show up to the meetings, right? There's nothing they to say. They could always be pulled in for testimony. Yeah. That's certainly true. Okay. 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 Dr. Hornbuckle, yes. I presume? Yes. yes. Uh, please, would you be willing to join us at the table and welcome to Senate Education? <clears throat> I don't believe you're from Vermont. I am not. I'm so, from Iowa. And uh, would you like my card? No, no, no. I mean, uh, uh, we, we believe you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Trustworthy group. Uh, and I'm sorry I'm dressed so informally. I've been tromping around Vermont schools this week and uh, weekend. Okay. So it's been a wonderful work time. I've had an opportunity to see some Vermont and talk to Vermonters. Great. So we have you here to come and talk to us about PCD testing in schools. So yeah. tell us first a little bit about yourself, sure. what, why you're here and what you're doing, and then you can talk a little bit about um, sort of things as it relates to this committee and where things stand with PCD testing. Sure. And then I'm sure people have questions. Yes. Um, so I've been studying PCBs for about 30, almost 35 years. I'm sorry, sir. Can you just say your name for the record sure. and if you're with a company or? Yeah, I'm Carrie Hornbuckle. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Iowa. I teach and do research as part of my job as a tenured professor there. Um, now I'm about 50% on research um, because we, we have a large research program. In PCBs, actually, uh, I've been studying these chemicals for a long time, um, and was primarily working in ecological systems. Uh, and I was interested in how PCBs move from one uh, state to another, like from sediment to water and water to air. Um, and had been working in many different um, polluted systems around the country, from the Green Bay Fox River system in Wisconsin to the uh, Gary, Indiana, East Chicago area, and Southern Lake Michigan, Northwest Indiana, um, uh, around Buffalo, New York, and then started um, recognizing the importance of emissions of PCBs to air from contaminated areas. And then we started working more in um, locations that communities were concerned about those emissions. Um, and communities started inviting us to come, especially with respect to understanding dredging and the release of PCBs during dredging activities. And we developed uh, computational models and uh, measurement strategies for narrowing in on this uh, question. Um, so we, we worked in uh, New Bedford Harbor, for example, the largest PCB Superfund site of its type in the, in the country. New Bedford, Mass. In New Bedford, Massachusetts. And we, we went there at the request of the community and we uh, did an extensive sampling um, survey uh, and developed um, models to interpret data and showed the community around there that emissions were important, especially if you live close to the water. We also uh, developed a uh, network of measurements um, in the city of Chicago ran uh, air samplers on the back of health clinic vans that serve low-income families uh, throughout the whole city with the intention of looking for um, sources, large sources of emission of PCBs because um, we had discovered that emissions from Chicago explained PCB accumulation in the fish in Lake Michigan. 
So we've become really more and more interested in how people are exposed through their exposure to PCBs, especially through um, Superfund sites that are uh, either intended for cleanup or in cleanup process. People are very concerned. So uh, we started doing this work. We did a special series of studies with communities where we measured PCBs in their blood, in the air of their homes, uh, outside their homes, when they were near a Superfund site. And then we also had a rural community in Iowa who was supposed to be our control. We measured PCBs in their blood, in the air of their community, and in their food. We did surveys to find exactly what they ate. We went to the store and we bought it and measured their food. And then we discovered the concentrations of PCBs um, in their blood was about the same. In this very com uh, polluted community and this rural community. And that was very confusing until so we started evaluating all the ways that they absorb PCBs. And we discovered that inhalation children in schools was important. We were very surprised um, to, to realize that the concentration of PCBs in these schools in Indiana and Iowa were sufficiently high to be equal to, roughly, the PCB exposure people had through their food. And that was partly because these communities were um, not eating a lot of fish. They were eating uh, the American diet. and. Uh, which we classify as hamburgers and french fries and uh, food like, like that is commonly purchased by low-income families. And when we started to look at what, how, why, why their blood levels were similar, we, we ended up looking more and more at the air concentrations. Um, and that was about 19, or 2015. And at that point, when we were getting this data, I started to shift my thinking and my, and my work to look more at why these schools might have high levels and also whether they could be typical of schools. And so we began more studies of PCBs in schools in Iowa and Indiana. And we learned that um, the PCB levels, not only were they high, but they were also um, variable. They were variable from one school to another, and they were variable from one room to another. and that. Uh, helped us understand that there's specific sources in schools that are uh, legacy of the use of aerochlor mixtures that were commercially produced and sold between mostly 1950 and 1980. And so then we started to look more at the school age to see if that was a predictor, and it is. But unfortunately, older schools before 1950 were remodeled between this time period. And so the schools appeared to be most of them that we had studied who were built or remodeled before 1980 had PCB levels. And the concentrations of PCB levels that we were seeing in those schools were higher than we measured at any site anywhere next to the most uh, contaminated Superfund sites in the country, including living right next to New Bedford Harbor where the concentrations of PCBs we found at the highest was about 38 nanograms per cubic meter. That's living on the shore of, of a highly contaminated PCB site that also, yes ma'am. Yeah. Can, can you give us the numbers that you were finding in the schools? The schools that we found in Iowa and Indiana range from uh, less than 10 nanograms per cubic meter up to about 130 nanograms per cubic meter. And uh, compared to New Bedford Harbor or anywhere, including Chicago, all through urban Chicago, including the Fox River, uh, including right over the Indiana Harbor and Ship Canal, where um, the highest we saw was 38 nanograms per cubic meter. That was a big surprise to me. And so after 19, uh, 2015, we started doing more of these studies, and then we reported a series of studies. Uh, that showed that um, indeed schools have materials inside that then recirculate, that continue to release until they're removed. And working with schools in East Chicago, Indiana, we were able to show from our measurements that it was likely coming from the light ballast in their case. We were really proud when they decided to remove all the light ballast as a result of our work. Um, so then we began to develop this technique 
to, to uh, take a measurement and uh, identify what are the likely types of origin. Sorry, but the yes. were the, when you took the light ballast out, did the numbers go down to zero? No, because we don't know what they did. So the school didn't invite us to come back and do more measurements. We would have liked to do so, but they didn't see the advantage of, of that. Um, maybe we hope in the future they'll change their mind because there's very um, little data like this. It's very common that even in Superfund sites, it's also a problem. After they do the work, the reassessment is like a whole nother big study that people have mixed feelings about doing. But I'm sure it is true that they went down. The signal that we can see in the, on the PCB signal was just like the one that we know was used as the mixture in light ballast, as opposed to caulking or adhesives or hydraulic equipment. So I think it's likely it did go down. We had, um, at our, well, you probably you know the Burlington story, but in our yeah. tech center, one area in our tech center had 6,000 yes. nanograms per cubic meter. I walked through that room. Mm -hmm. And I saw many pieces of equipment that I'm sure were purchased during that time and had it in their hydraulic fluids or the dielectric fluids and electrical equipment. Yeah, and there was a and like a flame retardant that was put on the metal, the exposed and metal as well. Was that sampled and measured? Mm -hmm. And it was high? Yeah, very um, high. <laughs> when I walked through and with the, with the consultants and they pointed that out, um, we had developed an emission sampler that we're now using quite a lot in Vermont schools that measures directly what's coming off the surface and I couldn't figure out at that time how to put it on that material because it's rough but now we've developed a new system to measure it off of rough materials and um, we're, we're going to try that out in the future in that kind of system yeah I'd like to know too how important that kind of source is because there's a difference right between whether the material is there and whether it's emitting to the air and EPA's regulations are about the solid material and what you do when you find the solid material. But they don't have any yeah, they have advice. Air, yeah, they have, and they have no air standards, right? So Their air standards are rough guidance. Mm -hmm. right? But the, the thing that I'm concerned about is they don't have a way to link the air concentration to the solid material. In fact, it's counter, it may be counterproductive and more expensive than it needs to be. Like, Caulking, for example, is this often this little strip, and it's sometimes really high concentrations of PCBs, but because the surface area is small, it may not be important as an emission source. Same with if the PCBs migrate into the material around after the caulking has been there a long time. Well, it may be high from EPA's perspective as solid material, but it may not be an emitter at all. Mm -hmm. So we are now, that's now a big focus in my laboratory developing systems to uh, measure precisely and accurately the emissions off of the material and to track down the specific source. It's, um, we've had many, a uh, uh, number of experiences with districts that have decided to tear down the school, like Burlington, um, and that's not a sustainable approach, right? And, and so it's of great interest to us as engineers to so we're a group of engineers and chemists and statisticians, and together we think that we can help, we can develop tools to help schools identify, okay, this thing and, and not that thing, you know, that results in what you want to get to, which is way lower exposures for children. And uh, so far it's been very helpful and interesting. We've learned a lot. Yes. Did you ever, did, did you ever get down to the Albany, New York area? No, I GE, GE was uh, oh. dredging the Hudson River. Right. Because they're, they're had PCBs in the transformers that they could. Yes. And they, they were just dumping them in the river. Yes. So I'm sure there's some downstream. I down do know all about effect. that, okay. yes. I know there's, um, that's, a, of course, a really famous PCB site, yeah. you know, one of the biggest yeah. PCB, and it's also a very challenging problem. Um, and the communities, of course, in New York have been concerned that the dredging process results in increased exposure to them and, and some measurements have indicated that that's, that's the case. But again, the levels of their exposure are in the order of less than one microgram nanogram per cubic meter. And what we're seeing in schools is 
thousands of times higher than that. Mm. You know, and billions of dollars are spent to remediate sediments. <laughs> and what are schools supposed to do, right? And, and you know, for us, finding cost-effective engineering solutions to this problem is really important to us. I think so GE cleaned that up. By they itself. did. They were required by EPA to pay for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm really glad you brought up how to deal with this uh, problem because certainly knocking down every school and rebuilding is not sustainable as you said totally agree with that um, I would love to hear more about your ideas around um, renovating or whatever it is you see once you you know or deal mitigate mi mitigating I guess is the word for the PCBs um, while what we are planning to do, which is a sort of comprehensive school construction plan across our state, because we have so many buildings that are failing in so many other ways, septic, HVAC, structural, you name it, we've got all the problems. Um, how, how these two can sort of like, not only coexist, but how they can sort of inform each other as we're moving through the process in the next, I don't know, let's say 10 years. Yeah. Do you have any like, just anecdotally, yeah. anything you can share with us at well, this point? Ask, thank you very much for asking that question. I, I, it's remarkable to me how much we learn with the data. We make these measurements of the air concentrations, the air emissions, and also we walk through the school to, I've looked at a lot of schools now and also other environments, and uh, together, putting all that together, the data, the kinds of systems they have, the kind of materials they have, you can hone in much quicker on, okay, how can we do this effectively? And also capture the opportunity to link a, a, a remodeling or remediation with energy efficiency, with COVID controls. And some parts of the United States are also concerned about uh, wildfire or ozone outdoors and trying to figure out how to provide better air quality indoors. You know, if we think about that, all those things together, including you know, reduction of PCB exposures. You get double counting on all of it because it's almost all the same activities. It's frequent, for example, that um, old windows, old lighting, an old HVAC <coughs> system uh, is part of the PCB problem. And that's also a big part of the energy efficiency problem and could be part of the, you know, air quality problem in general. So. Um, you know, having that all available, having the, the PCB levels available, knowing about the relationships between these materials and emissions, um, allows you to just prioritize. You know, how, how do we decide where to start, and how do we plan in an efficient <coughs> way so that we capture the opportunity to make these other improvements in the facilities as we go? Yeah. Um, thank you. That's helpful. And I know, like, deciding where to waste stream, what goes in which waste stream is also going to be an issue as we take on this work, because I know it is in Burlington. Um, how do you, as a PCB expert, um, where, so for example, I would say generally in Vermont, our, our education system is, I'll just use the word struggling right now, um, coming out of COVID. Um, lots of high rates of mental health issues with kids. There's a lot of, you know, bullying going on. We have a teacher shortage. Yeah. We have a general labor shortage. Um, mm -hmm. Our buildings are crumbling. We're, have, we're struggling to recruit teachers. Mm -hmm. So it's already a system that is feeling kind of fragile and um, struggling, I, again, would be the word I use. Like, I don't want to say crisis. I don't think it's a crisis mode yet, but maybe mm -hmm. heading in that direction. How, how do you layer on top of that um, structure, that ecosystem, this like sort of other, what is it, what's feeling like burden. Yeah. Um, because it's not just a financial issue, but also um, I think some schools have experienced that when they do have levels that might be, that might trigger an action, mm -hmm. um, that there's not a lot of supports in place and, the, yeah. and they're feeling, they're, it's just been difficult. How, how do you like 
put those two together, mesh those two. Senator, um, <laughs> I completely agree. And the thing that's happened with our center at Iowa is that parents call us and they're fearful. And then sometimes they've got just a little tiny bit of information. Like they, um, well, there's some schools where parents have decided on their own to make a measurement somehow, and they've got a little measurement of a little bit of caulking from the corner of a room, and it's high in PCBs. And parents have decided to take their kids out of school. They've decided to homeschool on this. Um, they, they ask for more and more information. They ask us to, to guide them. And the thing that, that is, the, they don't have the data. They don't have the right data. Uh, they don't have guidance for interpreting the data. Um, they don't have communications that um, help them put it all in perspective. Um, I think that PCBs are scary. They're known human carcinogens. They're linked to ADHD and autism and heart disease and many other things. And people read that and when they Google it, they say, oh my god, gosh, they're here, these chemicals are in my school. And they overreact. Um, Managing the process is not easy, and I'm very sympathetic to the schools as they manage this. But they need they need help beyond beyond just the school principal trying to answer these questions. And certainly, the tragedy of taking your kid out of school is so much worse, in my opinion. <laughs> but people will will do that when they don't have enough information. They panic naturally. And our center is really trying to help people with that. I mean, we're trying to release as much data as we can, make as much data available on our website. We have a community engagement arm that helps us with that. And um, yeah, I can see that's a really big challenge for you too. I must say, um, in working with the Department of Environmental Conservation, the PCB team here in Vermont, I've been really impressed with their communications. Unlike most places, Vermont is putting the data on the website. And you can look it up on your school. And so you can see all the data that's already been collected for your school. So you're not in the dark like many places are. It's, and I imagine the schools that haven't been tested are also nervous because they haven't seen their data yet. But it's highly variable. Not every school is going to be in this situation. Lots of schools are not going to be in this situation. And people will be relieved. Some schools that need to know right. they're right. in that situation. Right. Can you say something about the air and, and what that PCB in the air, what that impacts in terms of health? I mean, that's it, one of the things that was striking was you said people off of the coast of New Bedford live right near the right Harbor. Right. That they were inhaling yes. PCB whatever it might be, it's a residue or whatever. At, and at that point, it was 100 something or another. But then Senator Gulick, I believe, said Burlington was, uh, Tech Center was 6,000. Is that the same measurement? Yes. 6,000. Yes. So, and those kids and teachers were working there for decades. Yes. And I guess I just keep coming back to, if there's another school out there for me, and I don't know if it's likely or not, I would want to know to get those kids and teachers out. 6,000, yes. whereas you were concerned about 100. Yes. Okay, thank you. That's exactly <clears throat> Thank you very much. Senator. And to follow up on that question, when you were talking about the study that you did earlier, did I, I may have missed this, but were you seeing higher levels of illness in those folks? Like we are, we have, no, we don't do that kind of work. Oh, okay. Um, that's very difficult work. I want to mention we're all exposed to PCBs. All of us have PCBs in our blood. It's um, very difficult to, to find a community that has no PCB exposure. And this is one of the reasons that epidemiological studies are so difficult. So instead, what toxicologists do, or in addition to doing, trying to des design the right study of humans, is do animal studies, molecular studies, cellular studies to understand the health effects. Um, someone once asked me, could you see, how do you make a correlation between people who have ADHD, for example, and, and PCB exposure? And almost impossible to do because everybody 
has exposures to PCBs. You can't find a population that doesn't, right? And um, furthermore, PCBs are metabolized in our bodies. And so even though you can measure it in our blood, it doesn't necessarily mean that's all we're exposed to because it converts <coughs> to chemicals that are still in our bodies and are much harder to analyze. So we can't design a study that's based simply on measuring people's blood. You have to know what they actually were exposed to, and you know, usually know. Okay. Other questions? So we're at this moment, if you will, where there is a, we've heard from our director of public health, Mark Levine, who was asked that we not pause, stop testing. People keep, the house keeps talking about it as a pause. It would, it would for all intents and purposes, the way the language is written, stop testing. And we're hearing, uh, again, so tomorrow, I guess Dr. Harry Chen is zooming in from Africa. He was Dr. Levine's predecessor, who was also concerned about the possibility of us stopping testing. So we're hearing from medical professionals. Can you weigh in a little bit on the possibility or the options around this idea of stopping testing? It sounds like collecting data informs. I think you have a wonderful opportunity with collecting this data. Okay. I mean, a wonderful opportunity to provide clear guidance to the schools. And you have a wonderful opportunity to help them think strategically about it. Um, most of all, I think it's an opportunity to spend less on, on improving your school because you know how to start uh -huh. on this really critical health-related issue. Right? What, if, uh, what if it's a matter of repainting? You know, or what if it's a matter of replacing the windows you already need to re replace? Or, you know what? It, it, it's such a wide variety, but you don't know until you make the measurement. You know about where it is. You don't know the magnitude of it, and you don't know the specifics of where to start. You know you're just um, you're you're lost in either doing nothing or doing far too much, and and that concerns me in my community because some some communities in Iowa anyway, where I was, uh, we fund our schools locally. And yeah. so communities that don't have resources are unable to do anything. And it's only then the communities that have resources that are make, making, able to make these changes. And, if they, and still, without the data, you, don't, you can't, you can't uh, make the changes in a feasible, effective way. You also are, you don't know how, what rate to go, how quickly to go. And when you find 6,000 nanograms per cubic meter in your schoolroom, you feel a little bit differently about the urgency even then what I used to think was a lot at 100, now I have a different opinion about it on the issue of urgency. Yeah, sure, sure. But not on, you know, I still want to find out where that is coming from yeah. and remove it. You know, if, if you measure PCBs uh, above about one nanogram per cubic meter indoors, you know you have a source indoors. And you probably were going to measure that in most, probably every school that was built before 1980. And so, you know, yes. Would you want to finish your thought first? Well, yeah. so I, you, you, we're not talking about going to zero, right? Yeah. You, you're not going to go to zero. What you're going to do is you're going to reduce the risk of health effects, and you're going to prioritize it according to the most severe, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I would say in our in the Burlington well you know this but there was that one area was 6,000 but then it varied greatly all over the building we had rooms with zero and well, one with three probably not zero because they had a high zero. detection limit yeah right so the, the, my laboratory can go to 0.01 nanogram per cubic meter oh, okay. but typically when you get a consultant they're between 10 and 20 nanograms mm -hmm. per cubic meter so you probably not at zero. Okay, maybe ten. There were a lot of there were a lot of ten. I, I don't remember, but right. All I know is there were both there were a couple that were extremely high and then mixed bag all over the place. But yeah. what would you say to I was reading a great piece from uh, Denmark, which uh, they're trying to rid all of their buildings, not just schools. All yes. of their buildings of PCBs by 2028. Yes. And their two numbers were action level of 300 and immediate action level of 3,000. Uh -huh. What do you What do you make of those numbers for? They had a Denmark is an amazing situation. They they built these uh, residential towers for people, and a lot of them, 
uh, during the between 1950 and 1980, and, and and then they continued after 1980. And so they have towers that are PCB free and towers that are loaded with PCB. Somebody was selling them very effectively there, and the levels were so high in those towers that had used PCB had PCBs. When they you also say so high, like like thousands. thousands. Yeah, in the thousands, and and in. In that case, they're so high they could even see it, uh, distinguish it in people's blood between the tower groups, which is indicative of really extreme exposure. Normally, you can't see that because of metabolism of the PCBs. So, um, so the rest of us as PCB researchers have watched that, um, and that data is super valuable to us to understand about the situation. Um, and they are trying to use that data also to understand the health effects. It is still pretty pretty challenging because PCBs um, cause health effects over a very long time period, mm -hmm. and they're not immediately. We don't know how to look for them on the short term, mm -hmm. and uh, but I think it will be valuable there. So I don't know how to answer your question because I don't think they can answer your question either. But they did make a decision about priority. Right? Yeah. Because they have all the data, they can say, okay, we can afford to do this group on this scale and this time factor. Well, we're going to leave this to a different time factor and different priority. Because they have the data, they can do that. Mm -hmm. We've been receiving a lot of emails and phone calls from constituents that they're associated with the school. Mm -hmm. And they're recommending they want us to stop the testing. Mm -hmm. and. I said, well, you know, what, why do you want to do that? Well, basically the response I got was, Vermont's standard for contamination is so much higher than the national EPA level. Lower, I don't know, I don't know sure. enough about it, so how do you respond to that? Well, there, there isn't any national standard in the United States. Okay. Um, and um, for air. For air, for air, there's there's rough guidance on based on little information or very difficult to compile and organize information. Uh, the numbers that Vermont chose are entirely consistent with the literature about what we know about the potential for health effects based on animal studies, cellular studies, molecular studies, and indications from human epidemiological studies. They're totally they're totally reasonable numbers. Um, I'm not a toxicologist, I'm an engineer, but of all the measurements that I've made and how um, people feel about having high concentrations near Superfund sites, I mean, I think they wouldn't really like having higher levels of these toxic chemicals in their schools than you would if you lived right next to this huge dump site. And if they didn't know what their levels were, then they could worry <laughs> that they're higher than they are. Right? There's going to there's gonna be a range, and there's no zero value. Even though the consultants might say non-detect, there'll, there'll still be some there. Helping people develop an um, understanding that, that there's, a, there's a range of concentrations, there's a range of risk, and we just want to move that all down. So we, we have less risk <coughs> of exposure. We will never make it zero. But also, it'll never be horrible if we know what it is and we take some action. It can always be a little better. And that's our goal for these toxic chemicals. Make it a little better. Make it a little safer. Keep going. So how can we work together with what's going on in Vermont and what you're doing? We're so we'd love to. We, we already are really pleased to be partnering with Vermont. Um, we're, making, we're using our research methods in some schools to help hone in on specific uh, sources. We're designing new samplers that are faster, more effective, and more direct at materials. Um, we hope that'll help schools make uh, more educated de decisions. Um, but yet, uh, Vermont's not using our data for regulatory purposes. It's just to help provide more information. And in my view, the communications that's happening here in Vermont is extraordinarily good. Keep doing that. Good. Show people what the data is. Help them understand their situation better. Provide them even more advice and guidance. Good. Yeah, I'm really, it's been an honor yep. to be involved in this here. Yeah. Excited. Yeah. So, uh, back to one uh, testimony. Yeah. Appreciate all your activity. And question is uh, given 35 years in, in the profession, 
do you have a, a thought on why the EPA hasn't established something which all states can use as a relevant uh, testing uh, risk level? I know they're working really hard. I know some of the toxicologists for EPA that are extraordinarily talented scientists. It's my opinion, and I could be wrong, is that the reason is because they don't know how they're going to pay for it. Not, mm -hmm. not the guidance, but the result of the guidance. What are we going to do when they put out a guidance and thousands and thousands of schools across the country can't meet it, nor can they pay for the remediation? I think, in my opinion, that's why they're not releasing it, because they have yet to figure out what they're going to do. And Hmm. I guess this is public and I should just go ahead and say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know that we are spending billions of dollars on sediment remediation. Yeah. And the reason we do is because of the fish consumption. But if people are not eating fish out of those contaminated areas, the next exposure we should be controlling is PCBs in school air. Hmm. In the school air. This has been excellent testimony, and it certainly confirms where I am on this issue. I don't think I've moved much. Uh, I would encourage you, and I know you're with Matt Chapman. I don't know if the House has heard this testimony, House Education, but I know they're starting to look into some, they weren't going to have time to talk to any medical professionals before I think they passed out their bill, so they're sort of jumping into that now, um, and it would be helpful if Happy that they, we I can reach out to Representative Conlin because this is really compelling, important testimony. Thanks for that I think it's really important for everybody to hear. Good luck. Thank you. And you're so you're leave, you're heading out soon. You're going back to Tomorrow Iowa. Tomorrow afternoon. Okay. All right. And you, are you in the building for the rest of the day or? I can be. Okay. No, I think <laughs> I, I, I'm, any other questions, Senator Kulik? I think I've asked quite a few already. Yeah. Senator Williams. Good. Yeah. Some weeks. Nope. It was really terrific. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. So we'll take a 10 minute break in case anybody wants to have additional conversations with Dr. Uh, Hornbuckle, uh, as well as we have Matt Chapman here uh, from the Agency of Natural Resources. And we'll come back and we'll jump in with Oriane. Use the bathroom. Thank you. Good. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> Welcome back to Senate Education. Uh, Bor Yang is with us. Thanks so much for joining us, Ms. Yang, uh, from the Human Rights Commission. You were with us early on uh, to talk about an act relating to miscellaneous ed, but specifically a uh, draft amendment that we have on bullying, harassment. We've continued to take testimony. We spent quite a bit of time yesterday hearing from uh, Ms. Heather Lind, who's an attorney, I believe, in Burlington who uh, provide us with a lot of good background information as well. And so we thought we'd have you in. And one of the things that's helpful in this committee process, honestly, is a little the back and forth. Yeah. You know? uh, so if you wouldn't mind um, telling us your thoughts on perhaps, uh, we'll leave it there, whatever you would like to. You asked to come in, whatever you would like to say. Yes, so thank you so much for having me back in. And I know you've heard a lot of testimony on this, and I, I really appreciate that. And so I'm going to keep my testimony brief today and then answer your questions if you have any. And I mostly want to spend my time responding to the concerns that you all have brought up. Okay. Um, because to me, that's, that's, that's the most important. So the first concern is one that I've heard from um, Senator Gulick and, and uh, maybe you too, Senator Campion, um, which is the is that maybe this bill might have unintended consequences, um, resulting in more suspensions and expulsions of kids, which might further exacerbate the school to uh, prison pipeline. And I want to share that you know students who are black, students with disabilities, LGBTQ youth are the primary victims of peer-to-peer -peer harassment. They are not the perpetrators. And they also happen to be disproportionately disciplined, suspended, expelled, and, and uh, represented in the juvenile justice system. So they are also the primary victims of the school to prison pipeline. And I mean, why is that? Um, because one of the things that I have learned as the executive director of the Vermont Human Rights Commission, and having spoken to a lot of people, having read a lot of studies, 
is that when marginalized community members are the victims, we tend to ignore it more and we tend to be more hyper-focused when they engage in bad behavior. Um, it is a phenomenon that not only shows up in schools, but in workplaces and in policing as well. I would say that if you want to address the school to prison pipeline, you should introduce a bill that limits or eliminates suspensions and expulsions in schools, that limits referrals to the police for behavioral issues, that limits police presence in schools, but you don't address the school to prison pipeline by keeping the harassment standard on reasonably high. The other concern that I did hear come out of this committee is the concern that we're holding schools accountable for behavior that has been learned by their parents or the community. And um, that is already the law. And it is good law because we should be held responsible for the environment over which we have control. Schools don't have control over the beliefs of parents and students, but they can control the school environment and reduce racist or sexist behavior within the school. That's what we ask of employers and businesses. So a supervisor cannot stop a man from being sexist or having sexist beliefs, but a supervisor um, can stop that employee from treating women differently in the workplace. The behavior is what we can curb and what we can limit and reduce. Remember that this is not a strict liability standard, despite some of the testimony that has suggested otherwise. Schools cannot be sued unless students can prove that the harassment occurred because of their membership in a protected class. Hard to do. And schools cannot be sued unless the student can show that they put their school on notice and their school failed to do anything. That's notice plus failure to act. Okay. Not just notice, but notice plus failure to act. Um, and then the third issue that was raised by the witnesses that opposed this amendment um, is that these Title IX regulations that govern sex harassment are coming out in May and we gotta wait for them before we move forward. And the only reason you would wait for the Title IX regulations to come out is if there's the possibility that the regulations will conflict with the changes here. Um, and here's why it will not. We already know what those regulations will be. They've already proposed what those will be. And most of the time, almost like 90% of the time, the ones that are proposed are the ones that are adopted. Many of the regulations are complementary, not contrary or contradictory to this bill. And the regulations address time frames and notice requirements, and they expand the definition of uh, what sex-based harassment is to include other forms of uh, like gender identity, sexual orientation, and so forth. The proposed amendment that is before you broadens the definition of harassment, gets rid of a insurmountable legal standard, um, and it can do that without any conflict with the regulations because state law can be more protective. It can always be more protective. In fact, Vermont has been more protective for years. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, yeah, of course. Can you, sir, can you explain what you mean by insurmountable legal standard? The, the severe or pervasive okay. standard, yes, has become such that it is in, uh, very difficult, even in a case where most of us would consider it to be harassment, could not get in the door. And what I mean by could not get in the door is they don't get to the jury even. They lose before the jury even gets to hear it, before there's even a trial. Um, so Ver the Vermont has been at the forefront has been the leader on civil rights and human rights issues. The Department of Education in 2023 is now only considering regulations that will consider gender identity and sexual orientation as um, an expanded definition of sex-based discrimination. Vermont did that years ago. Despite the fact that the federal government issues all of these public assistance programs, the federal fair housing laws do not cover discrimination on the basis of public assistance. Vermont did that years ago. Uh, Vermont has been the first and um, on many civil rights and human rights issues, and it should not back down now. In fact, now is the time to do it. 
when the Department of Education issues those Title IX regulations next month, the Agency of Education in Vermont will be rewriting its model policies this summer. This is the time that it should also be reviewing the definition of harassment for students in Vermont. Waiting requires them to review those policies again next year, which really isn't a good use of resources or time. The one consistent theme and message that we've heard across the board, no matter who has testified, and that we all agree on, is that harassment is occurring in our schools more than ever. Everybody is in agreement on that. The question then is, what is our role in addressing that? Um, and there's one thing I've learned, is that there is no singular answer. There's no one source of discrimination, like there is no one response to discrimination, and there is no easy path. It requires all of us to address what is within our purview. Everyone has to do their part. Parents have to do their part, no doubt. Schools have to do their part. Employers have to do the part. Police have to do their part. Advocates have to do their part. And as legislators, you have to do your part. Your part is to address the laws. That is what is before you. The institutions have said that these laws are, these current laws and policies are robust and no change is necessary. And a lot of witnesses have testified before you that those laws are not, and that BIPOC, LGBTQ kids, and kids with disabilities are left out cold. The choice is yours, undoubtedly. But choosing not to move forward, choosing to wait, is still making a choice. Um, I propose to you that this may be one of the most, if not the most important civil rights bills that you will advance as legislators on behalf of kids in Vermont. And to me, there's only one right choice and we have to choose kids every single time. So thank you for allowing me this last response to, to this. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It doesn't have to be your last, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, you can come <laughs> you want. Yeah. So, um, thank you so much, both of you, for advocating for kids. Um, it's so incredibly important. I have spent my whole life advocating for kids yeah. as well. And even today, I'm still getting emails and texts from students who are still relying on me as their trusted adult. I just got a text yesterday from a kid. She hasn't been my student in like six or seven years and she wants me to be a reference for her for a job. Yeah. I'm happy to do it, but I, it also makes me sad that seven years later I am still her trusted adult. Um, so I've already, you, you know how I feel about unintended consequences in my particular district, which I, I'm hoping Sparks can come in and speak to that in our Office of Equity, because I want to hear from, from them. Yeah. Um, but yesterday, I got a whole new sort of like existential angst, having listened to testimony, which is that for me, education, and specifically public education, has always been and is potentially the great equalizer, right, of our democracy. It is, as far as I know, the one institution that can potentially lift kids out of poverty. Mm. Yeah. I'm really worried about that institution right now. It is, and, I, and I'm asking you the same question. I've asked multiple people. We are on the verge of crisis. We're struggling now, I would say, public education as a whole. I guess I don't agree that this is an insurmountable legal standard, having talked to folks who are working in schools and who are, you're right, dealing with a lot of bullying. And they are maxed out in many, many ways. I've mentioned this before. There isn't enough staff. There isn't enough, their folks are retiring and quitting. I know an administrator who quit because she couldn't keep up with the Title IX issues. True story. Um, behavior issues off the charts due to the pandemic and other issues. I mean, there were yesterday on NPR, I'd recommend you all listen to the data that's starting to come out around social media and screen time and depression and anxiety, which is, we're finally getting that data. So, again, my thoughts yesterday were, here we are putting yet another um, I don't know, workload, another issue, another burden on our schools that are already stressed out to the max, 
to help kids, but are we not undermining the very institution that is there to lift them up by putting this one more layer on top of everything else right now? That's where I'm, I'm conflicted right now because we don't want to, we don't want to tear down the institution and degrade it to the point where it can no longer function as a way to, to serve our kids. And um, maybe I'm, maybe this is hyperbolic, maybe I'm over exaggerating. I wish someone could tell me that I am, but I, no one's been able to tell me that yet in the last 24 hours. Um, so I, again, I'm waiting to hear from our Office of Equity in Burlington. I'd love to hear from Winooski and Essex as well. Um, but that's, that's from where I'm sitting, that's how I th see things right now. But again, I really appreciate your advocacy. It's very important. I really appreciate that. And I, my, my response to that is um, two things, which is the burden that is already placed on our schools is already there. And we're talking about changing the standard for how they look at that and not creating more trainings but changing the way those trainings are done to encompass a new way to look at harassment. So it's not more, it's different. And the other thing I wanna say, just completely out of respect for that position, is that the same conversation is also happening in Senate and House Judiciary Committees whenever there's a bill that proposes to, to re-look at civil rights and the rights of people of color and LGBTQ and um, uh, people with disabilities, particularly people with psychiatric disabilities. And the same argument is made that the police are quitting, that there is not enough police people who are, oh, not people who are interested in becoming police officers. That is also the argument that is made is that they are also bombarded what they are being tasked to do. And I don't even disagree. I don't think we should compare police to educators. I just don't. I, I'm comparing the similarity and the conversation about when we advance civil rights stuff, that the argument is also made that we are short staffed, that there is not enough people that are interested in doing this work, and that people are quitting. And my thought is, that there are different responses to both of those things. You can advance civil rights of the people who are most marginalized in your community by changing the harassment standard and also support schools and teachers in a different way. But that bill to support teachers and schools is not before you. The bill that is before you is the, to change the legal standard. Now, if we want to have a companion bill to this that says we need to provide pay more, so that we can attract people, so that people don't quit. We need to create a bill that says we don't suspend or expel people for being perpetrators of harassment. That's a different bill. But that is not the, the answer that people are leaving their jobs or are un, unwilling to take on these tasks because it's so hard, and it is hard, and I recognize that, is not the response. The appropriate response is not to not raise the rights of marginalized community members. That, that's all. I, I, I mean, I yeah. appreciate that. I think we're trying to balance here that workload and protecting kids. Yeah. But it's, yeah, I think what's the harm if we don't do this? And I think, I'm afraid the harm is significant. And so I, I too am learning as we go here. I know we. There's some personal stories that were just shared with us uh, about situations that we'll get to the committee members. Um, we're dealing with PCBs. I mean, do you yeah. put an extra, you know, do you switch things around or do you make sure kids aren't breathing PCBs? Uh, I mean, I'm like, okay, yeah. don't breathe PCBs. I understand, I also have to, I worry a little bit, with all due respect to Senator Gulick, I don't want to keep calling this a crisis until we take more evidence and hear from, I, I think different schools are in different situations across the state. Uh, and I think we need to work with those that might be, certainly we do need to work with those that are on the edge as much as we possibly can. Uh, but as has been pointed out, depending sometimes where you live might impact whether or not your school is in crisis the resources it has, et cetera. So I just, I, I, you, you hear us all grappling uh, and having this debate, but uh, I, 
your testimony has been has been helpful to me, you know, to to understand the situation. And I would have to wonder, or I do wonder, do you have it in writing? Because it yeah, is I'm testimony to, yeah. that if you wouldn't mind eating. I'm happy to so provide that. I would also say that it isn't just where or which schools are in crisis, but the important question is who yeah. is in crisis. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, um, ask that, yeah. you know, if there's any hesitation, as yeah. you mentioned, bringing in the people who are most harmed by the existing policies and the existing trainings and the existing standard and laws are the people that you want to hear from. And as confident as I am in saying that I represent a lot of those voices that I hear, you need to hear from them directly. And that's important too. I totally agree. Related to Senator Gulick's question about or her hope to bring some folks in, can you help us with that? This yeah. Mr. or Mrs. I, I don't know who Sparks is. Is that a I, I'm in contact with okay. him. He's hope yeah. might be able to come in Friday. Okay. I would say that I And I recognize people are on vacation, it's yeah. hard, people's schedules. My work is such that I would not bring anybody in because it's all confidential. Yeah. But I do know that <laughs> NWCP, there's a lot of community groups that do have those kinds of connections yeah, we are without the to get confidential yeah. burdens that I carry. Yeah. Rightfully so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Senator Gulick and then Senator Williams. So, but just to be clear, you are putting the onus on the school, um, notice and failure to act after one event, after one um, transgression. Correct? Me? That's, that's the new definition. So the is that that could rise to the that a single act could rise to the level of harassment under the new definition, and that the onus is on teachers to report and investigators to review. But what we learn is that when they don't do that, they don't find it that there's more. Oftentimes there is more, not just the one, but the one should trigger the report. Right. And and. Teachers, I think, would be glad to just report it to the administrator who's tasked to do that job. Right? And the administrator who is tasked to do the investigation is already is supposed to be interviewing these individuals. The key is, is that knowing that it's just one time still requires you to review if there could be the possibility of there being more. That's it. But you don't see the notice and failure to act after one event as adding to a more litigious environment in schools. You don't see that connection. You don't see that happening. It, this isn't a strict standard that says any time someone uses one word that you're going to court. It still says trivial inconveniences and petty slights are not actionable. And what we do know is that we have case law that says even one groping is not enough. We have case law that says sexual assault one time is not enough. And we're saying that's got to at least get in the door for an investigation. We, we were told something different yesterday regarding from testimony that we had with, um, that that wasn't necessarily the case with, with a Title IX. It, right? Uh, this was Heather Lynn? Yeah. Uh, would you remind me what you recall so I can just confirm? Or that, just, it w that one time did trigger action. For, it should, yeah. but it doesn't. And there's case law that has said one time is not because the standard is severe or pervasive. And one time may not trigger severe nor pervasive. For sure, one time is not going to get you to pervasive. Rape will get you to severe, one time rape. But groping may not. Uh, we don't know that. We, we do know that there's case law that says it doesn't. And we have some case law that says it could get in the door. But we've had case, cases across the country where they have said that that has been lost. And the legal standard is still severe or pervasive to get into court. To, to hold a school accountable, you still have to show that it's severe or pervasive, regardless of what any policy says. We're talking about changing that legal standard so these kids get their day in court. Yeah. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah. You, you calm the mayor, you, you know what you're talking about. Um, you, you also said that you already know what the new Title IX is going to be. I asked the question the other day, if we already know what it is, why don't we start working towards it? Yeah. Uh, 
you know, if it's if it's that important an issue, why why are we? I don't think we should wait. I think we should. So the, they propose the regulations and then they ask for comments on it mm -hmm. and then they finally adopt it. And usually you just wait for the final adoption so before you act on it with policies and so forth. So you've seen the adopt the... The proposed, proposed regulations, yes, okay. yes. And what I'm saying is, having seen those proposed regulations, there's no contradiction here. You can create this law, this change or not. So what do they say about severe and pervasive? Oh, but that's still the standard. In yes. The Utah line. Yes, that's still the standard to, for it to be actionable. It, that it has to be severe or pervasive. Now that's undisputed. That in order for a student to bring a case in court, it has to be severe or pervasive. Okay. Now I want to tell you about a case that was lost at the Vermont Supreme Court involving a student who was raped, and she filed a claim. And the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme, because this severe or pervasive standard, as I mentioned, is inconsistently applied across the country. And the Vermont Supreme Court even said at one point, the student lost on um, administrative reasons because they had not uh, supposedly exhausted the, uh, the process at their school. But the, before the court uh, dismissed the action, the Vermont Supreme Court said, oh, well, we don't know that rape is, like, rape is bad, but is it even severe and pervasive? The Vermont Supreme Court even said, oh, the standard is severe and pervasive. There are courts across the country that are using an even more stringent standard that requires that schools, before you, uh, a case is action, has to be severe and pervasive. We know that's wrong, that the legal standard is severe or pervasive. That's what was came down by the US Supreme Court. But we're saying even the severe or pervasive pervasive standard is too high. What year was that? Which one? What you did the, the US Supreme Court? The Vermont Supreme Court? I don't know, last decade though. It, it's, yes. Within the last decade? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and the issue in, in that case, um, I remember it being that the student had reported the rape and the person who was receiving the report didn't know how to treat rape as sexual harassment. They said, oh, I didn't know, I knew it was like a sexual assault, I didn't know that was sexual harassment. Right, yeah. One form that we got yesterday, summary of major provisions of the Department of Education's Title IX notice of proposed rulemaking, yeah. says that um, prohibiting all forms of sex discrimination Proposed regulations would prohibit all forms of sex discrimination, including discrimination based on sex stereotypes, sex characteristics, mm -hmm. pregnancy related conditions, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, it goes on in section 106.2 defining sex based harassment, addressing off campus conduct mm -hmm. that creates or contributes to a hostile environment in a recipient's education program or activity responding to sex discrimination, ensuring recipients learn the possible sex discrimination. So it's got, I mean, there are yeah. eight pages. Of mm -hmm. It's almost like 100 pages of regulations yeah. that are coming up. Now, what's really, it's actually, these regulations are great. What they're doing is for the first time, we have a federal agency saying under Biden, that because a lot of these were lost under the Trump administration, that under the Biden administration, sex discrimination includes sexual orientation, rape, sexual assault, gender identity discrimination, and so forth too. And that's, that's wonderful, but it maintains severe or pervasive for it to be actionable because federal agencies don't change substantive law. They interpret existing substantive law. What you're being asked to do is change the substantive law in Vermont. You're being asked to change the definition and broaden the definition of harassment, which you can do. You can be protected. And there was a lot of testimony yesterday around how robust our bullying rules are. What is not before you today are the law around bullying. But I do want to just say they are not robust. We have kids who are, and families who are calling us every day about being bullied and they have nowhere to go. We don't have jurisdiction over bullying. Nobody has jurisdiction over bullying except the schools. Okay. They are not robust and we have families saying that nobody is addressing this. They don't have the right to appeal bullying to the agency of education. Um, it ends where the schools end. 
And so relying on quote unquote robust bullying policies to address things that don't get in the, that are not severe or pervasive is insufficient. It is not enough. It's inadequate. So for me it's helpful just to think of the the briefest description of what we be doing here, so I always think of an elevator speech, we'd be broadening harassment definitions mm -hmm. with this. So that students get more of a voice, more of a hearing based on one situation, but again, for action to be taken, severe and pervasiveness would have to be proven in order for a student to be suspended or expelled based on okay. There's a protection around discipline for the student. It's more on the school itself. If they ignore it, then the school itself would be held accountable. Yeah, so Tell me I'll, how much I'll, of that yeah, I get. Yeah, so okay. I'll read some, okay. right? Yes, please. Yeah, so, um, if you change the legal standard and yeah. broaden the definition by getting rid of severe pervasive, yes. and you adopt what we say here, which mm -hmm. is looking at the totality of circumstances, and that someone can belong in multiple protected classes, and that it's possible that one instance is enough, but it, that instance cannot be a trivial slight or a petty inconvenience, right. or what did I say? Petty inconvenience and trivial slight, like, I forget. Um, is that if a school is on notice and a school fails to act, and you can, a student can prove that that harassment is because of their membership in a protected class, that they could bring a claim to court, and that that claim could get to a judge, and that claim could get to a jury. Do we know that they're going to be held liable? No, because it is ultimately up to the jury to determine whether that rises to just trivial petty inconveniences, or, or whether it is harassment that as a society we go, yeah. We don't want this. We don't want this. Now, when we're talking about should we be disciplining kids who engage in harassment, that's a question for the disciplinary policies that each school adopts or each supervisory union adopts for how they ought to address that. I think there's some good statistics out there, which of course I don't have before me, is there are very few, especially around sexual harassment, very few students are being suspended or expelled for engaging in sexual harassment. They're like, really low. So this idea that they're being suspended or expelled because of the harassment is not necessarily the case. But as I mentioned, if our concerns are around disciplining kids for engaging in harassment, that's not this bill. That could be a different bill that we could use. questions for Ms. Yannick? Good testimony. Great testimony. Thank, thank you no all. No matter whether you, we agree or disagree, I mean, it, it was well done for sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And you'll thank provide you us time. with really something in writing. Absolutely. To, to yeah. Ms. Garces, anything from you at this point? Or we're, we're okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll put this up for probably tomorrow afternoon to decide which way we want to move on this uh, Friday at the latest. Um, and if anybody needs to hear from anybody else, I think it will actually, let's wait. We will hear from, uh, is it, I'm sorry, is it Mr. Starks? Sparks. Sparks. Mr. Just Sparks. Just, that's his name. Sparks. Okay, just so we'll hear yeah. from Sparks at some point, uh, hopefully on this issue. Okay. We're waiting for Ledge Council, so why don't we go off for a second, and Beth is going to come here uh, and talk with us a little bit about 483. Sure. Good. And, okay. So can we go on executive?